goes into the trial of John. Peter stays outside, gets scared, denied the Lord three times. Are they, are they being scattered and broke apart? Looks like it. Looks like it. Now, think about this. If, if you were to look at the chapter 9 of your Bibles of, of Luke, verse 22, you'll find that right after Peter makes his great statement and says, you are the Christ, Jesus says to them, well, let me tell you something. I have to be killed. I'm going to go to my grave, but in three days I'm going to rise. He said that way back in chapter 9. It's not the only place he said. He says it again, probably down in chapter 9, in a different setting. And so he's been telling them, I'm going to die, be in the grave, three days of rise. Let me ask you something. It's Easter morning. Is there one disciple who's saying, okay, night on Friday, Saturday, it's Sunday. Hey, let's go preach. It's resurrection morning. You'll be seeing Jesus any moment. Was there one? Was there one? What happened? <clears throat> Why have these disciples forgotten everything they heard for three years? They have followed Jesus for three years. He's the Messiah. He's going to reign, they think, now. <laughs> And then in three days, he gets arrested. He gets so brutalized, so horribly beaten. He seems so overpowered by the Romans. They put a cross on his back and he staggers as far as he can go. And they have to take it off because they've almost beat him to death already. They've hammered a crown of thorns down on his head. They take him up the hill and they nail him to that cross, set it up, and he hangs there for six hours. And then he dies and his body slumps. It's like the horror of this whole thing and the fact that this looks like so much defeat for Jesus that they're just in shock. They don't know what to think. But here's what they don't have anymore. They don't have faith anymore and they don't have hope anymore. When you look at what we just read here in, in, in uh, Luke's Gospel, what's Mary taking to the grave? What's she prepared to take to the grave? What is that stuff? Something to give to Jesus when she sees him? No. The only thing she's got is she spent the weekend preparing it with stuff to put on a dead body. She's got ointments to put on and wrap around and put on Jesus' dead body. She, not, she doesn't have a drop of faith that she's going to find Jesus alive. Here's what's amazing. Even when she gets to the tomb and he's not there, it never enters her mind. He might have risen. No, what's she start doing? And did, did you take his body? Uh, show me where it is. I, I've got these spices. I want to I put them on the body. Where's the body? Looks like it's working to me. Looks like what the Jews thought would happen is happening. <laughs> Where are all the disciples on this day? 
Where are they? They are hiding. The ones from Galilee are hiding, and the ones who were from Judea, they're just scattering. Hey, they're already on the way home. It's over. Notice how true this is of all of them. In John 20, when they try to tell Thomas, that Jesus is alive. Here's Thomas's response in verses 24 and 25. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his, in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his sight, I will never believe. Now listen, we call him, this is not doubting Thomas. This is unbelieving Thomas. I will never believe unless I get this. Listen, the only thing that takes Mary and the women to the tomb is they love Jesus. They want to do one last thing because they love Jesus. She was forgiven much. We don't know all that it means. The Bible says she was, seven demons were cast out of her, but she was forgiven much and she loved much. And so she was determined. She planned all weekend. I'm going to do the last thing I can do for Jesus. I'm going to anoint his body. And then she's upset because she can't find him. Where's the body? Now listen, while this is going on, we've got two other disciples in the same chapter, Luke 24. What are they doing? They're on the way home. They're on the way home. They have followed Jesus, but that's over now, and we got to get out of here. Let's go home. And so let's, let's visit these guys again. It's Cleopas and one of the disciples. They don't give us his name. But... Uh, Verse 13, Luke 24. It says, it says, that very day, two of them, disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. As they were talking to each other about all these things that had happened, or as they were going, going there where they were talking, uh, verse 17 says, Jesus approaches him and he says, And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who has, does not know the things that have happened uh, here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty and deed and work before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. What they say? We had hope. <laughs> we had all our hopes on him. But they're hopeless now. They're going home. They're leaving. Now, now, get this. Verse 22. Moreover, some women of our company 
company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he, that he had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And here's what's amazing. They've heard that much, and they're still walking. They didn't go back to see. They're not going back to check it out. Oh, no. We're going home. We had hope, but now we don't have hope anymore. Looks like, if you look at that, it's working. So what turns all that around? What turns all that around? Mary's looking for a body, can't, upset, can't find a body. Tom says, I'm never going to see till I see those holes in his hands and I can poke my finger in. And these two are saying, well, we had, we had hope. We had hope. Think about this. Think about this. Think about the conversations leading up to this, right before they begin to the crucifixion. You've got disciples that they are, they're trying to finagle around and uh, make sure they get the best seats after Jesus takes over and, and has his kingdom. James and John, now we want, we, want, we want one of us here, Jesus, and we want one over here. And their mom is behind the scene. She's trying to help get it done. This is where their heads are. And then Jesus is smashed, absolutely smashed, crushed before their eyes. Well, if it works so well, it's an amazing thing because you know what? Today, people all over the world are gathering to celebrate Easter. What turned everything around? One thing. Jesus was alive. And one by one, group by group, he showed himself to all these disciples who were faithless and hopeless and proved he was alive. If he hadn't have done that, it would have worked. Listen, their plan worked fine on Friday, on Saturday, but early Sunday morning, it just began to fall apart. Mary's at the tomb. She can't find the body. But when she goes outside, somebody says to her, Mary. And she turns, and who does she see? She sees Jesus. Grabs hold of him. And he said, don't claim to me. <coughs> the two on the man's road, they're walking along. They get home. Say, Come on in. They don't, they don't recognize Jesus. Come on in here. And when he starts breaking bread, they realize it's Jesus. And he, just, he's, he disappears. They just walk seven miles to a mess. They go, we gotta go back, we gotta go back. And they run as best they can back to Jerusalem. They go to where the disciples are. And the first thing they're told is, he, he, he arose. He's a, he met with Peter today with Simon. And they tell their story. And then while they're talking, this crowd has been so hopeless and so faithless. Jesus appears. Jesus appears. There he is. He does show him his hands. But he eats with him. Thomas is not there. Of all the people, not the bigger. Thomas is not there. Makes his statement, I'll never believe it. But eight days later, guess who shows up again? Jesus. Jesus. Let me, let me read you this. He just made a statement. He said, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood.
stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Put your finger here. See my hands. And put out your hand. And put it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. What turned all this around? They saw Jesus. Here we are. Two thousand years later. And there'll be two billion plus people celebrating Easter in some way on this planet. Listen, why? Because Jesus showed himself alive. And guess what? He still does. Let, let me read you how, how, how Paul sums this up in 1 Corinthians 15 about the appearance of Jesus. He said, For I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Not many years have passed when he writes the first one. <laughs> then he appeared to James. James is one of Jesus' half, half brothers according to the flesh. Never was a believer while Jesus lived. But Jesus appears to him. He becomes a believer and a, and a great leader. Then to all the apostles. Then, then Paul says this. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. He, and he's talking about his Damascus Road experience where he's going to persecute Christians. All of a sudden, a, a, a great light shines on him. And Jesus speaks to him. And Jesus calls him to be an apostle. Listen, most of us here in this room have had our own experience with Jesus, maybe not as dramatic as Paul's, but every bit as real as Paul's. We're not getting here today, and we're not getting all over the world because of something that happened 2,000 years ago, and we just believe the history of it. We, like Paul, have believed on Jesus and received Him and experienced Him and we know He's real for ourselves. He's not dead, but He is risen. He lives in us. And so, our plea to all is this. Seek, and you will find. There's a lot of doubts in this world about Jesus, about the, about the resurrection. Is he alive? I'm in it. Changed my life. All in one evening. All by myself. No preacher, no choir. I started talking to Jesus, and Jesus just came into my life and changed me. And I want to tell you, He'll do the same for you. Calvary covers it all. All sin covers. Trust Jesus.
today to trust Jesus, what a great day to say, I, I, I believe I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. If you're here today, the other commitments you want to make, make them today. Come into this church, put your membership here, whatever. Recommit your life. Come pray in the altar. No standing or what? Stand together. Jesus, he's alive. Sing it again. 